Well, this is indeed a, a pleasure and an honor to be the one to introduce our next keynote speaker. I think everyone affiliated with the papers of William F. Cody can probably tell you the first time they encountered Louis Warren's work, Buffalo Bill, or, uh, Buffalo Bill's America, William Cody, and the Wild West Show. So all of us rely on this groundbreaking scholarship, really, to pose our own questions and to move forward. And we're just amazed with the creativity that Louis brought to this book and some of the new areas he brought William F. Cody. He's moved it beyond questioning whether or not William F. Cody actually rode for the Pony Express or not. And I'm not going to get in a fight with you, Paul Hutton. Sit down. <laughs> sit down. <laughs> sit down. We've got a, our own Kanye West here. So <laughs> anyway, moved it beyond that debate and has raised some really interesting questions about how the Wild West shaped American culture and, and European culture. And I mean, a lot of us were just amazed the connection between Brahms, Stroker's Dracula and Buffalo Bill. And just thinking of the idea that Buffalo Bill was the one who killed Dracula. <laughs> so John, you have your next game there. So, Louis S. Warren is the W. Turrentine Jackson Professor of Western U.S. History at the University of California, Davis, and the author of the most recently publication, God's Red Sun. And I, this is on order. I'm hoping maybe it will be here tomorrow, but it may be under the wire. But I'm hearing a lot of good things about this, and as soon as the conference is over, I'm going to sit down and read it, Louis. <laughs> I uh, also greatly enjoyed Louis's first book, The Hunter's Game, Poachers and Conservationists in the 20th Century America. And it was just a wonderful, profound take on this other side of the conservation and preservation movement and how it related to the cla uh, class structure of the United States. He is the founding co-editor and first editor-in-chief of the peer-reviewed magazine Boom, a Journal of California, which was honored with the Best New Magazine Award in 2011. He's received numerous awards for his writing, including the Albert Beveridge Award in 2011. Oops, sorry, I jumped ahead there. I need my glasses. Um, the Cahey Western History Association Prize, the Western Writers of America Spur Award, the Great Plains Distinguished Book Prize, the National Cowboy Hall of Fame Wrangler Award for Best Nonfiction Book, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. So we are indeed blessed to have a scholar of this status joining us this evening to deliver the keynote address. So please join me in welcoming Louis Warren. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Jeremy, for the lovely introduction. And thank you for having me here and for organizing for you and all your staff and for the entire uh, Buffalo Bill Center of the West for organizing such a fantastic conference. Uh, it, this is great. Um, the whole event has been just wonderful. And it's a very rare thing to get to sit down with so many people who are thinking seriously about Buffalo Bill Cody. Uh, my own introduction to Buffalo Bill Cody came when I was probably, in my conscious mind, when I was 10 and home from school and picked up a childhood children's biography and read about him. Um, it came across him again in graduate school, uh, where they were taking a lot of things very seriously. <laughs> um, but c interestingly enough, I was surrounded by a lot of people who were doing PhDs in American studies and other things who said, no, you really, really, really got to take this, this guy seriously. This is a really interesting, interesting phenomenon, the Wild West show, they would say. Um, my first book was on hunting uh, and struggles over hunting, particularly in the American West and how uh, attempts to control who got to hunt and how much and with what kicked off a whole series of conflicts, some of them quite violent. Right? Um, and I, I mentioned Buffalo Bill Cody in that book, but I didn't think much about it. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do when I was done with that book. And I came to the story of Buffalo Bill Cody because I had, was teaching the story of the Wild West show year after year. And 
every year that I've taught it, most of the time when you teach something and you've decided what you're going to say and you get your notes, right, most of the time it becomes, it makes more sense with each passing year. When you give the lecture, it makes, one year, it makes more sense than it did the year before. But with Buffalo Bill, it just kept making less and less sense what I was, what I was saying. And I was very conscious of that, right? That uh, the story got weirder as the more I told it, the weirder the story was. This guy from Frontier, Kansas, who becomes the world's most famous American. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a, you know, and a showman too, right? You got P your P.T. Barnums, right? You got your Ringling Brothers, and their stories are a little more comprehensible along that line. But how did a guy from K Kansas become the world's most famous showman? And that was the origins of of this book. Right, and y you know, I, uh, I, sh I will show you in, in a minute. That I will, you'll see a slide of this cover, but the cover doesn't begin to convey. You know, it's really, really, really thick. <laughs> this book, <laughs> and um, the the problem I have tonight is that I'm supposed to say something that is is uh, potentially publishable as something new, right? And after five hundred and um, no, sorry, good Lord. <laughs> With this index, it's 652 pages, right? After that, what, is, what do I have left to say? My, my undergraduates <laughs> and my kids will say, you know, please, you just don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, my son, if he were here, my youngest son, I could just picture him like, Dad, it's okay, you don't have to say anything more <laughs> about Buffalo Bill. Uh, but I, I, I really, there is actually a great deal more to say about Buffalo Bill and I just want to try, uh, there's certainly many people at this conference are saying new things about Buffalo Bill. There's a great deal of new material to sort of chew over and new connections. And in that it's all, uh, it's all very inspirational. So, but I am gonna try to present an idea about talking about Buffalo Bill's Wild West that came to me somewhat while I was working on the book, uh, and I've rethought it many times since. It didn't go into the book, um, and it, it, but it, uh, and it, it hopefully will be something that will be worth uh, your while, and, and you can let me know during question and answer. Uh, and for that to happen, question and answer, I, I gotta get going. So, uh, this poster from the 1894 show uh, at Ambrose Park, Where We Are, is a great way to start thinking about how Buffalo Bill's Wild West spun a classic frontier narrative, a story about the conquest of far-flung lands that ultimately becomes a modern nation. Now this tale, I think, that the Wild West show tells is fundamentally epic. It centers on a hero of incredible stature, and that's part of the issue, right? It's, it is such incredible stature. Uh, but, but William F. Buffalo Bill Cody himself in this epic struggles in a vast landscape in the American West and particularly the Great Plains with his success foretelling the success and the triumph of the nation. And it's his rise that corresponds to the rise of the American nation to sort of world power status that he's tracking in this show. And that's a very, very powerful story, and it works really well for, for him and for many people who've treated him since. But what if we imagine his show as the generator of a very different type of story? What if we look away from the frontier narrative for a moment and explore an alternative set of stories embedded within the Wild West show? I'm talking about what recent historians have called borderlands narratives, in which the subject is a person or people on the margins, on the margins of society, on the margins of settlement, and the ending is uncertain. In these stories, there is typically no national triumph to serve as the story's climax, and the tales end with ambiguity, no clear future. And how does this, how would that kind of story relate to Cody's life? I love this story of the inevitably transcendent guy, right, who just keeps winning. It just keeps getting better, right? Uh, but if we tell his story as a borderland story, uh, what does that do to it? Is his life only comprehensible as a glorious success? Or is there a sense in which the loose ends of the frontier narrative, the murky borderland stories that hang like untied threads in his tightly, otherwise tightly woven fabric, can be as intriguing and provocative as his epic tale? 
Now, we've seen in recent years a new wave of Cody scholarship and a new wave uh, of scholarship generally in American studies that puts the Wild West and American culture generally in a transnational frame that explores how Buffalo Bill's Wild West was a co-creation, not only of Cody and his American performers and the American public, but of international publics in England, France, Germany, Italy, and elsewhere. And I did quite a bit of this in my book, and I was very pleased to see the edited collection from Frank uh, Christensen, right? The Popular Frontier, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and Transnational Mass Culture. The idea here is to do a kind of history that is international and comparative, and to show the connectedness across, across international lines of these sort of popular culture phenomena. I think cowboys are one thing, well, there, there are many things, but let's just say cowboys fit in one kind of category in 1886, before the Wild West show goes off to London. And by 1888, when they come back and they've met with Queen Victoria, they potentially mean something else. And that something else is a co-creation of Britain and uh, of America and the British publics, right? And the, and the crown of England and everybody else who sort of creates this transatlantic idea of the cowboy, which sort of puts it in a new, f that's a transnational kind of history. I am proposing today that we think about Cody's frontier epic in relation to borderlands history. So what is borderlands history? It's not exclusive of transnational history or of the kind of a Western history in which I've grown up, history of the American West in which I was trained. Borderlands history is a field of scholarship that has flourished in recent years by focusing on the stories of people and their relations to the borders between empires, nations, and other institutions. Now in these histories, lines that customarily mark the edges of historical scholarship become the center. Often the subjects are people who in some sense live their lives on borders. Sometimes they negotiate a borderland space between formal empires or nation states. Many Indian people did this in the colonial era, right? Played off the French and the English against each other. Played off the English and the Americans against each other. The French, the English, the Americans, and the Spanish, right? Very much a kind of borderlands uh, livelihood in doing that. In fact, a lot of borderland scholarship comes out of American Indian history. Other times, borderlands people or the subjects of borderlands histories traded and that you find they trade and migrate back and forth across borders as a strategy for survival and success as capitalists have done in the 20th century and in the 21st century as workers have often done and as many varieties of other migrants have done since the beginnings mostly of the, of the 20th century when the modern borders of the nation state take shape. Uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which was an international community from its early days and became more so after Cody and Salisbury developed the Congress of Rough Riders of the World in 1892, was in a sense cross-cut by borders of its many participants. All of those people who came from around the world to be in the show had to negotiate their way into this space of the show arena and the show community and the show camp. Right, they had to cross numerous borders to get there. They had all kinds of authority to do it from federal administrators and so forth. Uh, American Indian participants had to do that kind of thing too, getting all kinds of layers of permission to be there. And it was the, the Wild West show and the Wild West arena and the Wild West camp was in a sense a cultural borderland. Now, uh, in a recent article, the historians Pekka Hemelainen and Samuel Truitt offer a suggestive list of the prominent characteristics of a borderlands narrative. How do you recognize it? Uh, and they say things like borderlands stories are tales of economic exchange and cultural mixing. They're anchored in spatial mobility, situational identity, local contingency, the ambiguities of power, very academic-y. I mean, that's a real <laughs> academic talk. And those are two, two really smart guys, two very smart people, and two of my best friends. Um, and it's a really smart article, but so far in that description, in addition to sounding like history professors, right, what it sounds like is a frontier story. Right? What's the difference between a borderland story and a frontier story? But then they draw a firm line between borderland and frontier histories, and this is where they really caught my attention. If frontiers were the places where we once told our master American narratives, then the borderlands are the places where those narratives come unraveled. 
If frontiers are spaces of narrative closure, then borderlands are places where stories take unpredictable turns and rarely end as expected. Now, perhaps the greatest distinction is one of narrative meaning. As Hemelinen and Truitt explain, the old nation-centered stories, like Buffalo Bill's Wild West, were often epic. They're driven by the ending. The ending is going to be national triumph, national culmination, right? And this form requires that the story end then with nations and empires being ascendant. In Cody's time, the most familiar epics to the American public would include the Iliad, right, which is a poem about the world, the war that births the world of classical Greece, uh, and the Aeneid, a poem that tells the story of the founding of Rome. By 1880, Americans thought of westward expansion as very much deserving of epic stories. And Cody's show, in this sense, spoke to popular demand. At the same time, the academic history of the American West as a scholarly field was in this tradition. Frederick Jackson Turner's essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, history which he first delivered in 1893, took on epic dimensions with a tale of settlers struggling against nature to create community and a new nation. Borderlands, uh, and of course this kind of image of John Gass's American progress, right, which is very much in the epic tradition of these settlers pushing uh, native people and buffalo right off the painting. You know how it's going to end, that telegraph wire, that city in the distance, the railroad, the, the, the liberty floating above with the, with the book of uh, school book, education, right? It's all going to triumph and the nation will be ascendant. Borderlands histories, on the other hand, tend to be romances. They're stories of movement and adventure with no <laughs> definite end point. Romance tales were also very popular in the late 19th century. Don Quixote is a romance. This is Pablo Picasso's uh, illustration for Don Quixote. So I'm cheating a little bit because he's a 20th century artist. But uh, it was a very popular story in the 19th century too. Shakespeare's The Tempest is another romance. As stories of movement with no definite endpoint, romances are, in a sense, I think, ideal for reimagining the history of our own time. I'm not saying we don't need or have epics, right? But I am saying that romances can be very useful for thinking about an era, our era, in which the world has been globalized in ways that make the nation state simultaneously more powerful, right? And I think about a movie I saw called, now I'm gonna forget the title, right? Uh, Helen Mirren, I think it was called, was it Eye in the Sky? Was it, uh, it's, it's about the drone wars, right? And a nation that is that powerful, that it can send a, a, a tiny device into the home of somebody across the world to survey who they are and actually track down, in the movie they're actually tracking down some seriously bad guys, right? And the movie's about the complexity and the moral problems of, of doing that and the moral costs of what happens when civilians uh, get injured in this kind of thing. But the nation is so powerful, right? But at the same time, the nation is so powerful in our era, the nation is also more porous than ever, right? So the nation also has to worry about cyber hacking of elections, right? And that there's an enormous deal of anxiety about borders in our era in which the nation state seems more powerful than ever. And I think that in this era, romances can be really useful. This is an era when preordained endings and triumphant culminations are either elusive or complicated by contradictory outcomes or both. Borderlands histories might engage any region of the world, and uh, there are borderlands histories and studies that focus on Asia, Africa, Europe, and the oceans connecting them. They're all over the place these days. But a primary locus of borderlands scholarship, and the place where most historians agree that borderlands history was born, was the region of the U.S.-Mexico border. And this is a map of 1847, Mapa de los Estados Unidos de México, Right, which shows you Mexico before the U.S.-Mexican War. And it's in that era, uh, in that place, the region, where Mexico and Spain and Mexico were formerly dominant uh, and the United States took over. It's in that region that the borderlands historians tend to focus. And also, I would say they go south of the current border. Northern Mexico today is also part of their focus. It was in this region 
in the early 1900s, at the same time the Wild West show was playing to huge audiences, that a young uh, professor, Herbert Eugene Bolton, who was teaching at the University of Texas at the time, he first began to explore the role of Spanish missionaries and officials in civilizing, as he put it, the northern reaches of New Spain. Now, Bolton had been a student of Frederick Jackson Turner's at the University of Wisconsin, and he was very much influenced by the frontier thesis of, of Frederick Jackson Turner. But this Turner's thesis, which is again an epic of Westering Americans and critically in a virgin wilderness. Is one, of, one of the problems with Turner's thesis is that native people figure only as kind of other elements of nature in that thesis, right? But to Bolton, Bolton wasn't thinking so much about the native people in, the, the, in, in Turner's thesis. What he noticed was that when you went to the region of the former Spanish empire, when you're teaching in Texas, right? And you're down there where Spain and Mexico at one time ruled, the, they had, in preceding the U US, those powers had radically altered the region's polished politics and reshaped its institutions in ways that had a lasting impact on those states. And what he felt was that it just didn't help to think of that region as a virgin wilderness. You really had to think of it as something else. Now, he didn't use the term borderlands until 1917. It was actually coined and suggested by one of his editors as a term that he should use. Um, and he uses it here in this book, The Spanish Borderlands, A Chronicle of Old Florida and the Southwest, which was a very influential book in 1921. And this marked an intellectual rethinking of the American Southwest as a region, again, that had this longer history of domination by Spain and then Mexico and then the United States and a more complicated history, right, than, than much of the rest of the West. Well, Bolton's career extended into the 1940s. Um, he retired right before the Second World War. He gets called back to service to teach these classes of over a thousand students at UC Berkeley. This is where he's teaching um, for most of his career. Um, and he teaches, he has an, an influence on a great many students, he teaches a class on the history of the Americas and the borderlands. That's, that's the way he approaches the subject and the discipline of history. And it's through his teaching that the Southwest, of what we now call the Southwestern United States, right, that its history in the era before the United States comes to be seen as less as a wilderness than as a space remade by a distinctive Spanish empire and its successor republic, the Republic of Mexico. It was this region of the US-Mexico border about which many of the foundational histories of the borderlands were written when the field revived in the 1980s and 90s behind the leadership of David Weber, James Brooks and others, are one of Weber's uh, classics here, The Spanish Frontier in North America, uh, which is, I think, early 19, about 1992 that that book came out. Now, what, how does all of this connect to Buffalo Bill? Well, although his goals, of course, were very different than from those of Bolton and subsequent Borderlands scholars, and by the way, it was, it was Richard White who first compares uh, right, Buffalo Bill Cody and Frederick Jackson Turner uh, and I think here what we need to do is think about Cody in relation to this historian Bolton. And what was Cody thinking at the same time and how does he approach the same problems? Cody incorporated borderland stories into his show from the beginning. Now we shouldn't be surprised at this. If the frontier story is an epic and the borderland story is a romance, it's one thing we should take note of is that tellers of epic tales are constantly including little romantic asides and romantic stories in the midst of the epic, right? That's a very common tactic for telling an epic story. Tellers of epic tales have woven romances between the lines of their epics, and Cody would use the odysseys of some of his performers to cast into sharp relief the epic contours of American expansion. Now, in this connection, the U.S.-Mexico borderlands were a referent in the Wild West from its beginnings. In 1883, the very first Wild West show included a contingent of Mexican vaqueros. By 1885, the show's narrative arc had attained a high degree of coherence, and show programs gave a substantial introduction to the vaquero of the Southwest. There was a whole section in the program, a small section, but a section nonetheless devoted to him. The vaquero, it claimed, marked only a slight line of demarcation from the cowboy, but that demarcation was crucial. 
where the cowboy is usually an American, that is, a white man, inured from boyhood to the excitements and hardships of his life, the vaquero represents in his blood the stock of the Mexican, or it may be the half-breed. Now, Mexican identity itself and the use of the pejorative half-breed marked vaqueros, of course, as men of mixed race, men from the border between races. And they showed signs in the programs, right? They showed signs of racial degeneracy, which the public often associated with racial mixing in late 19th century America. And this is a big concern in late 19th century America. Remember, after the Civil War is when a term is invented to describe race mixing, miscegena miscegenation, which is, I think, 1869, the term is first used, right? Uh, it's, it, there is a profound fear in this period and right down to the present day, not only in the United States, around the world, about decay and degeneracy and how to recognize it. And some people felt the mixing of races was, was what, that, what brought that on. According to the show programs, the vaquero could be distinguished from the cowboy. You could tell by looking at him in the distance because he's more of a dandy in the style and getup of his attire than the cowboy. He was fond of gaudy clothes like circus performers. In fact, the, the program says, I'm paraphrasing here, that upon seeing, first seeing a vaquero, a gentleman might feel or might believe that a circus has broken out in the neighborhood. Right? <laughs> Uh, and that's significant, right? Because Cody's always just trying to distinguish the Wild West show from the corruptions of the circus. So there's a kind of a little, there's a corruption and a decadence about vaqueros. Lots of fun, great to look at, <laughs> kind of corrupted and decadent. Uh, they're prone to drink to excess and then they become dangerous. Right? Now, who authored the language in the programs isn't really clear, but let's just say it, I'm almost positive. I'm 99 and three quarter percent positive. It's John Burke, right? <laughs> who echoed in his trademark florid style, much of the rhetoric of the era. It was a literary convention of US authors in the 1880s and, and politicians and everyone else, the public, uh, that Mexicans were treacherous and unstable, just as they originated in the mixing of Spanish and Aztecs, so they were deemed unlikely to remain loyal to cause or country. Now, as much as he bought into these stereotypes, to I, Burke is constantly luring you in with everything you're comfortable with, all the beliefs that you're comfortable with at the time, everything that's gonna make you feel good. And he'll reaffirm and tell you, yes, that's absolutely right. You are correct, sir, right? I, he's constantly telling you, come on in, come on in. You, everything you believe is right is gonna be reassured and reaffirmed by what you are about to see. And then, uh, when he plays up the decadence of the vaqueros, at that same time, he's very careful to soften the critique of them so that they can be included alongside Indians and cowboys as noble, vanishing men of the frontier who also provided wholesome entertainment. Okay, so like the cowboy, the sketch concluded, the vaquero was brave, nimble, careless of his own life. He could be reckless with the lives of other people if occasion demanded it, but in general, he was self-reliant and hardy, and at heart, he's not bad. Right? <laughs> now, what do you do with all that when you put them in the arena? Right? In the arena, vaquero contributions to the entertainment centered on the show's energetic racial competitions. Vaqueros constituted a unique racial contingent, like Indians or cowboys, against whom they frequently competed. So you get the race of races, uh, which is pictured here, an Indian cowboy. Carol, and they mix it up all kinds of ways. A grand quarter mile race among four Mexicans, four cowboys, four Indians. Um, you, there are lots of races and racial contests in the show. There's also roping and riding of wild steers by cowboys and Mexicans. Um, that steer's just way too big, but it's all right. <laughs> it's all right, bull riders, you know. Uh, acts like these remain central to the show through the bankruptcy of 1913 and on into Cody's last performances with the 101 Ranch Show in 1916. Now with all this in mind, we might say that Cody's show acknowledged the presence of Mexico in the American West and the continuing contributions of Mexican and Mexican-American people to US history. They're there. They're doing their own stunts. Kids don't try this at home, right? I mean, they do a lot of very dangerous things and they're very good at it. But in other ways, the presentation of Mexico and Mexicans in Buffalo Bill's Wild West was curiously understated. In a show where Indians were, the central and their, were, were central and their primary adversaries were white cowboys, 
Perhaps Mexicans were bound to become marginal, where Indians against cowboys represented the polemical struggle between the forces of savagery and the forces of civilization, right? Mexicans represented what? They represented the mixing of races. And they represent the expressions of desire, the sexual mingling of Indians and Europeans. And that's a really dangerous place to go in the late 19th century, right? So in Buffalo Bill's Wild West, they become less epic heroes than romantic <laughs> figures whose adventures in the Wild West ended not with national triumph, but with, a, 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 I guess, presumably a quiet vanishing into the past. Let's take a look at the way they are presented or the way the show works and where Mexican people, Mexican vaqueros fit in the show. Uh, it helps to remember that in addition to the displays of speed and, and skill in which the vaqueros participated, there are two other primary categories of show acts. Right? The first of these are historical reenactments of specific historical events, uh, in which Cody, Cody claimed that he had been present at all of these, most of these specific historical events. Right? He claimed, it, he, in the early days, he would actually ride into the arena to try to rescue Custer and arrive too late. Uh, that gave way to just simply uh, other things. But uh, th these specific historical events included things like the duel between Buffalo Bill and Yellowhand, the Battle of Summit Springs, and Custer's Last Stand. Uh, sometimes in the later years, these expanded to these sort of big reenactments, the great train holdup and bandit hunters of the Union Pacific, which is based on, no, it's responding to the great train robbery, which is the movie of 1903. This is about 1907, and they did a live reenactment of this to try to, because they're competing with the great train holdup in 1903, which was itself based on the holdup of the train at, uh, in Nevada w in 1900 by, by, uh, by the, the Wild Bunch. Now the second category of these, these are specific reenactments. The second category are the generic reenactments. And these feature tableaus meant not to present specific historical moments so much as to evoke passages in frontier history. These would include presentations of the Pony Express, an institution with which Cody also claimed historic association. If anybody wants to talk about the Pony, Ex Pony Express, <laughs> anybody except Paul Hutton, I'll be happy to talk to you about it afterwards, right? Uh, no, we, we, this is the, actually the point of my book that gets the most commentary from people. Uh, is you sure he didn't ride for the Pony Express? I think it's because it's the beginning of the book, and that might be as far as people get in that monster <laughs> tone I showed you. Um, but the, these, the other uh, generic tableaus would be a pioneer wagon train and the attack on the settler's cabin that was the show finale for most of the show's three plus decades. Now, Vaqueros participated in all these tableaus, but none of them could be construed as stories that were centrally about Mexicans or Mexican Americans. What did they do during these tableaus? Well, when the chips are down in the show, the vaqueros join civilization to fight savagery. So the culmination of the shows in 1884 and 85 was the attack on the settler's cabin, and it's described in the programs as attack on settler's cabin by Indians and rescue by Buffalo Bill and his scouts, cowboys, and Mexicans. So they're there riding with the cowboys to rescue that cabin from the Indians. Now in this sense, the show papered over its own ambivalence about the role of Mexicans in the history of the West. The scenes validated the vaqueros as proper frontier heroes who, if they had no heroic achievements of their own, were at least adjuncts to the Anglo-American conquest of the plains. Now the thing is in future years, that ambivalence about Mexican vaqueros actually heightens. By 1887, they've been dropped from the description of the finale. The attack on the settler's cabin becomes attack on a settler's cabin by hostile Indians repulsed by cowboys under the leadership of Buffalo Bill. And that's how the act was described for the rest of its life with the show. Uh, up until 1907, the settler's cabin was the finale and after that it, it disappears uh, completely. Now it may be that members of the Mexican contingent continued to play the same role they had in earlier years. I think that's probably what happened. They joined the cowboys to repel the Indian attack and it was merely described differently in the program in a way so that you wouldn't pay attention to the fact that the vaqueros were there. And it may be that for this scene, Mexican performers simply assumed the role of cowboys. 
for all the racial competition that's in the show's script, and that sense that the show projects that there are hard racial lines on the frontier that divide that old frontier, right? It is a racial frontier. As much as it's a geographic thing, it's a racial thing. There was, in fact, remarkable, remarkable fluidity between the boundaries of so-called cowboy and Mexican contingents in the arena. To a degree, this reflected real life. On the range, some Mexican writers might style themselves vaqueros, but by and large, they mostly joined the ranks of Anglo, black, and eventually Indian cowboys. That's how they were known, as cowboys. Cody had met his lead vaquero performer, Antonio Esquivel, when Esquivel trailed a herd of cattle from Texas to North Platte, Nebraska, where Cody was living and where, in 1883, he assembled the first Wild West show. It seems unlikely that Esquivel styled himself as a vaquero with gaudy clothing on the trail from Texas. But even if he had, most observers would simply have seen him as one of the many Texas cowboys who made the journey. There's a lot of disparate, I won't go into it here, there's a lot of disparate wear gear uh, between cowboys coming up that trail from Texas. Some wear cowboy hats, some wear very different kinds of hats, right? So that there's a, there's a way in which the Mexican, Mexicans and Anglos and Mexican Americans blend together on that trail, which isn't to say they all get along, but they do, uh, for outsiders, look very similar. There were, to be sure, actual performers from Mexico in Cody's extravaganza. Vicente Oropesa, a famed roper, uh, traveled with Buffalo Bill's Wild West in the early 1900s, but often Cody's Mexicans were in fact Americans. Programs claimed Antonio Esquivel was born in Mexico, that he was the champion vaquero of Mexico, but he was actually born in Texas to a Polish immigrant mother and a father who, it appears, immigrated to Texas, not from Mexico, but Spain, after it was already part of the United States. Now, that makes him sound like a fraud in some places. You might say, well, he's not Mexican at all, but I'm not sure the name Esquivel Right? And the Spanish heritage may mean that other Texans simply said, yeah, he's Mexican, and met or Mexican-American. They probably would have said he was Mexican. I don't know if he identified that way or not. It's very hard to know much about the Esquivels because there aren't a lot of documents about them. But during his many years with the show, Esquivel performed both as Mexican vaquero and as American cowboy, sometimes on the same day. His brother, Joe Esquivel, rode the same trail to North Platte as Antonio and signed up with Cody the same year. He was presumably as much vaquero as his brother, but for years he served as the director, not of the vaquero contingent, but of the cowboy contingent in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And he performed, it was Joe Esquivel, who performed with another show cowboy named Ben Galindo, right, who I think is actually Mexican-American, those two guys together became gauchos in the Congress of Rough Riders in 1896. So Cody relied extensively on the Esquivels for their performance skills, which are notable, and their managerial skills. And Joe Esquivel in particular, managing the show Cowboys, you can imagine it's not always going to be an easy job, right? A 1903 photograph taken in London depicts Buffalo Bill with his Cowboys. Cody is seated in the front and center. And the sources that I've looked at identify the man on his left as Joe Esquivel and Antonio Esquivel as the man on his right. And this show, this, this image is Buffalo Bill and Cowboys, right, 1903. Uh, other than the Esquivels, we know precious little about those who performed as show Mexicans. And the paucity of sources is striking, especially compared to the amount of documentation concerning Indian performers and even cowboys. Uh, and it speaks to the marginality of Mexican performers in the show. It's almost as if Cody wasn't quite sure what to do with them. He had to do something. But he wasn't, in some places, not quite sure. And in some places, he innovates. In 1886, when they were showing the drama of civilization at Madison Square Garden in the fall, a huge season for the show. Libby Custer came to the show and in great press coverage. And they reenact Buffalo, they reenact Custer's Last Stand and all of those things. Um, they opened, Cody opened the, what I think might be the nation's first Mexican restaurant outside of the Southwest. Uh, it was almost, I think it's the, definitely the first one attended by New York journalists. They don't have food critics at the time. Um, it's probably a good thing. The journalists really didn't like the food. The reviews were colorful, but not favorable. 
And apparently the experiment was not repeated. Now there had been restaurants where you could buy chili, chili con carne in San Antonio. The, the, they're the, the chili queens who would serve, these women who would serve bowls of chili in San Antonio and people could go buy them for I don't remember how much money. Uh, Texas had those kinds of things, but generally speaking, Mexican restaurants were not a thing, right, until the, 20, until, you know, the late 19th, early 20th century. Mexicans were borderline figures for most of the non-Mexican public, and their presentation, like their food, was bound to be met with ambivalence, with fear of their racial difference, along with desire for their exoticism. They're, they're, fantasi they're, they're, they're fascinating people because they're exotic. Containing this popular ambivalence within the show perhaps required that Mexicans be scripted primarily as allies to Americans. I think also though, this idea of having the Mexicans and the Americans as allies reflects certain ideological strands and political realities of the period. Uh, there was in a, oh this is just a picture of, of Cody's Cowboys, uh, 1907 and I don't have the names to identify everybody, but you can see there are Mexican-American cowboys, right, among the cowboys, and some of those men would play vaqueros during the vaquero shows. Now, uh, as I write in my book, there are many times that the uh, show, uh, whoever was handling the arenic performance, Johnny Baker in a given day, would say, you know, he says to Luther Standing Bear, I've got, uh, Again, that's Luther Standing Bear, not the same Standing Bear, not Arthur's uh, ancestor, but a different Standing Bear from, from Rosebud Reservation. And he says to, Johnny Baker says to Luther Standing Bear, we've got plenty of Indians in the arena today. You want to be a cowboy today, you, you can be a cowboy. Uh, and Luther Standing Bear says, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, me show, let me show these cowboys how to ride, right? And he puts on cowboy clothes and heads out, and that happens all the time. Uh, the one group, the one contingent that that never happened to, where only members of the actual contingent are allowed to play themselves as Indians. Cody did not let anybody else present themselves as native other than native people. That was a, the bedrock of the authenticity of the show. Now, uh, in, I, I guess we could say that one of the things the show might be reflecting in this era is that there is a kind of rhetoric in the 1880s and 90s uh, uh, particularly among governing circles in government in, the United, uh, in Washington and government in Mexico City, that these two nations, Mexico and the United States, can cooperate in the settlement of Mexico's far north. Right? That, that settling and civilizing this savage frontier uh, would, be, it would be helpful to build railroads, right? And the president of Mexico after 1876, Porfirio Diaz, he says, we're gonna build railroads, we're gonna, we're gonna build up Mexico, and he invites American capitalists to come in and invest. And this happens, and in the first, at the, about the time the Wild West show begins, 1883 is the first Wild West show, 1882 sees the, the development of the first trans-border railway, right? And there are railway networks built across the northern Mexico with American capital. Uh, officially, uh, the U.S. and Mexico shared a vision of improving the deserts of the American Southwest and Northern Mexico alike. To many investors, the, front, the border of Mexico represented a kind of new frontier or maybe a continuation of the old frontier. And by 1900, American investors owned almost all the land on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. But if the show alliance between Americans and Mexicans echoed the era's international politics, that they're both gonna get together and, and fight off savagery, right? If the, Mex if the alliance between cowboys and vaqueros is sort of reflecting that, there's very little else about Mexico in this show. It's actually kind of surprising. It, it's one of those absences that when you start to listen for it, the silence is deafening, right? Buffalo Bill's Wild West did little, if anything, to acknowledge that Mexico had once held the U.S. Southwest, right? There's no mention in programs or any of the literature uh, that I've come across that even mentions the U.S.-Mexican War. There are even signature moments, that they don't even mention signature moments in the history of the U.S. Southwest. Uh, there's no reference to the struggle for Texas. There's no Alamo. There's no Battle of San Jacinto. I can't remember if Davy Crockett comes up in show programs. He's kind of there for Cody as a reference in his earlier career, but Cody's careful with that uh, for various reasons. Uh, there's no Sam Houston. 
In fact, while the borderlands of personalities appeared in the show in the form of Mexican-American and Mexican performers, and while some cowboys would identify as being from Texas and the U.S. Southwest, Cody and his manager seemed to have gone out of the way to avoid depicting the U.S. Southwest or Northern Mexico. Um, and I guess one of the way, best ways to prove this is by the exception. John Burke would call himself Arizona John Burke. And the only reason he did that, I'm convinced, is because everybody knew he had nothing to do with Arizona, right? <laughs> uh, he had that kind of sense of humor. And um, he would sometimes call himself that way, almost as a kind of parody of the rest of the things that are going on in the show. Uh, I think the show, in many ways, tries to, most of the time, tries to avoid the subject of the Southwest. And why is this so? Well, we might speculate that the absence of the Southwest is because, you know, it's an epic. In the, this show is an epic. And the epic is a, has to be map the life of the hero, and the Cody is its hero, and he's got a Northern Plains life. He moves from Kansas, right, to Nebraska, and then to Wyoming, and that maps the progress of America. So he never took a substantial interest in Mexico, and the show could only do so much then with the Southwest. There, there really wasn't much it, that they could go to. We may speculate also that Buffalo Bills might, might have avoided, oh, sorry, Buffalo Bill might have avoided Southwestern history to keep from reminding audiences of the long history of hostility between the United States and Mexico. The cent show's central tension is between civilization and savagery, and that's symbolized by white people and Indians. And if you have fights between Americans and Mexicans, whites and Mexicans, whites and mixed race, right, this only distracts from the main event, the Alamo here. But perhaps most compelling of all was the difficulty in construing the region of the U.S.-Mexico border as a landscape of epic victory. Now, the Northern Plains in this sense works a lot better. By 1883, it was easy to see the United States had won the Northern Plains, right? You could claim that, right? Its battles were finished. By 1889, when the Wild West ventured to Paris, Wyoming and Montana were about to enter the Union. The Dakota Territory was about to become not one but two states. And Lakotas, who were the central Indian performers of the show, were a seemingly vanquished minority of about 25,000 people among a settler population that outnumbered them more than 10 to 1 in South Dakota alone. Now, a show, that's, that's the Northern Plains. If you go to the Southwest, it's a much harder sell to say this is a landscape that's been conquered. The victory over Indians was almost as complete. Geronimo surrendered for the last time in 1886. But the history of the region made it a poor fit for the Wild West show. Uh, I would say that California and Texas both have real drawbacks as epic narrative. First of all, the early history of the two places is dominated in part by the mission. And how do you make an epic drama that's based on military combat about missions, right? You can try, but, and people have tried, and I've seen some of those movies, and I don't want to see them again. Um, <laughs> By and large, the history of Spanish and Mexican, California and Texas and of the whole Southwest would remain the domain of romance, right? That's, that's part of what goes on with that. And it's not easily reconciled with American the American public's longing for epics. Indian wars characterized both, both California and Texas, but in California, the Indian wars were bloody to the point of genocide, right? And you could say that about most places, but California particularly so. And this illustration from the period is it, I, possibly somewhat accurate, except I would say most of the time what happens is this, the, guy, the white guys in the camp are actually descending on an Indian village that's not expecting them, and the Indians have very little chance to fight back at all. They're mostly fought on foot, those wars. They're not easily presentable in, a, in an arena, they make poor subjects for showmanship. Now, in Texas, obviously, you've got the Comanche Empire, right? And the Comanche resistance to the Texas is epic stuff, right? Texans have a great epic narrative about that. But here, you encounter, a, if you're Bill, Buffalo Bill Cody, you encounter a whole different set of problems, stemming from the fact that Texas is not only a Western state, it's a Southern state. That's the Texas flag of the Confederacy. It joined the Confederacy in 1861, and when you narrate the history of Texas, you raise that issue, which for Cody and his contemporaries, who were Union veterans, that's, that in itself is a thorny problem. As he loved to present his show as a kind of place where the, the, the North and the South reunited. Uh, but as, as we saw earlier in, the, in Nicole Edgerton's paper, 
uh, at this conference, right, that, that he's really, his show leans strongly north. Uh, and we also saw that today uh, when we, you know, we're seeing today that it, Cody's show was most popular in the old, in the Midwest and the Northeast, in that industrial heartland. It's never a huge hit in the South. Uh, if Cody felt this way, that the South really didn't fit in his show, the sentiment was mutual and enduring. In 1936, the Dallas camp of the United Confederate Veterans publicly rejected a proposal to erect a monument to William F. Cody at the Texas Centennial Exposition. There was a proposal from somebody to put up a statue of William Cody, and they said, um, no. Mm -mm. Uh, they said that he was irrelevant to the history of Texas, and that he might be better erected in buildings exhibited by one of the northern states. Okay? Now, Texas and California anchor the two ends of the border, U.S.-Mexico borderlands, and between them, so maybe there's some material in between that Cody can go to to put into his show, and that's uh, where you get his New Mexico territory and after 1863, New Mexico and Arizona territories. And it's a region full of gunfights and mining booms and the stuff of Western legends like the Earps and Billy the Kid, right? But, and from time to time, references to this region appear in show programs, right? Um, but generally speaking, it's, it's very much tangential and on the margins. And the reason for that, I think, has to do with the fact that the Hispanic population of the American Southwest was rapidly increasing in this period. Right? There were probably 100,000 people of Hispanic descent in the United States in 1850, right after the U.S. acquires that region of, from Mexico. And with the push from migration, between 1900 and 1920, 700,000 immigrants would arrive from Mexico to the United States. The numbers are actually increasing quite dramatically. New Mexico territory went as a territory for so long precisely because there were so many people of Mexican descent there. And Congress didn't want to admit them while they're in the majority. It's not until 1912 that New Mexico becomes a state, which is almost at the end of the Wild West show. And if you'll notice, the Wild West show tends to celebrate those regions which at the beginning of the show's life were just about to become states. New Mexico was a long way off. For a racial frontier epic to unfold properly, racial minorities have to fade. And one way of interpreting Mexican performance in Buffalo Bill's Wild West is as a wishful spectacle, an example of prospective vanish vanishment through assimilation. In the same way the Esquivel brothers vanished into the cowboy contingent, Americans often hoped to see Mexicans assimilate to the United States and fade into whiteness. They could be subsumed in the flood tide of Anglo migration, just as they were absorbed into the cowboy contingent in the defense of the settler's cabin and other historical reenactments. I think the charge up San Juan Hill is significant in this context. Then they do this big reenactment of the charge up San Juan Hill, right? And uh, that's in it right after the victory in you know, the Spanish American War. It's a huge moment. And there's some ways in which that moment is mythologized as a coming together, right, of the Rough Rider contingent, Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Rider contingent, which of course borrowed its name from the Wild West show, although Roosevelt never had the decency to say so, right? Um, people ask me, were Cody and TR really good friends? <laughs> really? No, I, I don't think so. They, they knew each other, they respected each other, but there's, there were real tensions between them, and part of it was over that. But the, the, that, the Rough Riders were drawn heavily from the Southwest, included many people who were Anglo and had Spanish last names as well. And it, the, the charge up San Juan Hill in some ways is kind of a, a moment of unity that unites this segment of people from the Southwest in the service of the United States under the commander, command of Theodore Roosevelt, of course. Now, there are ways then of putting, of, of referring to the Wild West without making it, cent or to the Southwest, without making it central to the show. But the, the thing about an epic is that if it's a racial epic, the racial minorities are supposed to fade. And the refusal of Mexicans to fade in real life made it more difficult to romanticize them as noble fading elements of the old frontier. It was much more easy then to refer to them in programs and show imagery to make Mexicans in the show ephemeral and at times invisible. In many ways, Cody's challenge was to contain Mexicans and Mexico within his show, to script them as border men who joined the side of the conquering power 
and to not acknowledge the long history of U.S.-Mexican hostility, the whole fight for the Southwest, the whole Texas struggle, or the growing presence of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans within the United States. It's just, if you're going to do a mass entertainment that's going to make a lot of money, just don't deal with those issues, right? Now, this strategy was successful until the show's latter years, when the contradictions of Borderlands development became irresolvable. Uh, there are a, there's a rising sentiment of unrest and rebellion against the order that Porfirio Diaz has introduced into the northern borderlands. There are continual rebellions in the northern borderlands. Uh, the the uh, Wild West uh, show incorporates at this moment uh, Mexican r rurales, right? These are a rural police force established by the government of Mexico who patrol the countryside and put down these revolts. But by 1910, uh, here are rurales here, by 1910, Mexico has exploded into revolution. And in northern regions, peasants rebelled against loss of land to Mexican and American capitalists. Rival leaders challenged the government of the then President Carranza. Uh, two of the most powerful, Emiliano Zapata on your right, he's the guy in the two men in the, in the center here, Zapata on your right, Pancho Villa in the, uh, on your left. Zapata is in the south, Villa is in the north, and they form this potent alliance, but there are a lot of other revolutionary leaders. And between 1910 and early 1916, Americans were mostly at sea as to which side, if any, to support in what became a series of multifaceted conflicts. But you could be sure that William F. Cody is looking for an angle and how to incorporate these dramatic events into his Wild West show in a way that will resonate with a mass public. He was hoping to demonstrate the relevance of his frontier epic to current events, and he sought to integrate the Mexican Revolution into his show. He begins to, at this time you can follow in the press, begins to comment publicly on the war in Mexico and how it should be conducted and what people are doing wrong and sort of making comments without making any commitments to any particular side. Reportedly in the winter of 1915, agents from the 101 Ranch Buffalo Bill Shows, which is what, where Cody went after his bankruptcy in 1916, he ends up with the 101 Ranch in a partnership. And agents from that show, uh, sought to capitalize on the popularity of Pancho Villa with Americans. This is Pancho Villa, who was referred to as the centaur of the north. Right? And in a show that had long billed itself as a display of centaurs, right, this was a natural fit. Right? And what they did was they went down and have reportedly secured an agreement with Villa to join the entertainment in a return, the return for a guaranteed income of $500 a day, reportedly. How Cody meant to synthesize Villa's performance with the show's larger emphasis on frontier heroics and U.S. preparedness is impossible to say. But what might be most significant is that Cody appears to have gambled. And I would say it's Cody, they have to, again, this is the way Cody operated. You worked with Cody, you had to run every significant development past him. And some that you thought were insignificant, if he, he thought they were significant, he'd let you know. Right, that you had really screwed up. And I, I was saying, I mentioned that we had a conversation about the posters, uh, right? That if, if the posters didn't look right, he would come down on you like a ton of bricks, right? This kind of thing was what he did. And if he's in partnership with somebody, he knows he is the draw. And so I am, I'm always assuming here that Cody is the one they had to run this past and that he had some idea of how to uh, put Via in the show and how to make it work. But it didn't matter because it didn't happen. If the agreement with Pancho Villa was real, Villa didn't honor it. In the spring of 1916, instead, he led his famous attack on Columbus, New Mexico, a move that earned him a place in American history books. Right? Uh, it also earned him a place in the show of a very different kind from what Cody had originally envisioned, but hey, you have to innovate in these things, right? <laughs> the 1916 season would be Cody's last performance season, and the Battle of Columbus would be the signature tableau, because the head show's headline or historical tableau, in which actual veterans of the army units that pursued Villa in the aftermath of his invasion of New Mexico would participate. Now, the actual content of this tableau is, uh, has been impossible for me to assess so far. I've yet to find a review that actually describes the performance. But we might see it as an urgent, perhaps even desperate attempt to do what the show's narrative had always done, to contain the story of Mexico and Mexicans so that Americans could emerge triumphant and in control. 
But in real life, such outcomes would remain elusive. Villa would evade the military effort to find and defeat him. U.S. General John Blackjack Pershing would lead a column into Mexico. This is them preparing to head off in pursuit of border. They didn't catch up with him, and Pershing is, by many accounts, right, saved from a really big embarrassment uh, by the outbreak of World War I which uh, by, uh, for the United States, which allows him to lead the American Expeditionary Force to France instead of still trying to hunt around for Villa. The border would continue to be a zone of contest and uncertainty long after. If the containment of Mexico within the show had failed, then vaqueros themselves remained figures whose significance and meaning were uncertain in the show, whose stories seemed to end not with the U.S. conquest of the West, but with something else that lay outside the realm of the show's narrative. And I would point out, too, that 1917 is the year that Bolton's editor suggests the term borderlands for his writing, as if this is a land of borders that might slip away from you at any time. Right? If vaqueros, uh, and if vaqueros, borderlanders who could be unstable and destabilizing figures, uh, are, are appearing in this show, it's worth noting they were hardly the only border people to appear in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. In 1886, during the show's performances at Staten Island, Métis rebels from Canada, including their leader Gabriel Dumont, rode in the arena. In future years, Rough Rider contingents included, included Cossacks, actually Georgian circus riders, and Magyar Gypsy Chicos. I'm not sure who they were, but apparently <laughs> they're from the Balkans, right? None of these people were living out an epic. None of them ever saw the birth of nations that corresponded with their ethnicity. They were, in that sense, border peoples living out borderland stories. In many ways, Buffalo Bill's Wild West used such stories, the romantic wanderings of frontier peoples, to throw into sharper relief the success of America and her preeminent frontiersman, Cody himself. Now, I think that these borderland stories can be useful for analyzing the Wild West, and we ought to think about them more because in some ways they describe the contours of performers' lives better than epic narratives can. Consider Antonio Esquivel. He rides with the show from 1883 to 1892. Nate Salisbury hires a uh, governess for his kids while the show's in England named Clara Emma Richards, and Esquivel marries her. Uh, they end up leaving the show. They have five daughters. By 1900, Esquivel is employed as a sanitary officer. I'm not sure what his duties were, but that's what he was in Texas. And in 1903, Cody comes to him and says, please come back to the show. I really need you. We're going back to England. His wife, Esquivel's wife says, no. Claire Esquivel, no, I, I, I got these kids. I, he says, you know what? We will put you up in London with the family, right? Esquivel says, I'll only go if my family goes. And off they all go to London. They're there for some years. Uh, after 1906, he leaves the show. They all move to Orange, Texas, and he goes to work in a sawmill. And he and Clara Esquivel, Antonio and Clara Esquivel, separate in 1912. And she takes the children to England during, <laughs> during World War I. Right? Eventually, they divorce. Antonio Esquivel may have returned to work with Cody one last time. He rode with the 101 Ranch show in 1916. I don't, was he in the Battle of Columbus? I, I don't know. Uh, in 1930, he was living with his brother Joe and their family on their farm. And he died of pneumonia in 1938. Now, Esquivel's story to me is not comprehensible as a racial or national epic. Perhaps this is because epics are not well suited to biography. Epics are rarely honest, writes the novelist Sherman Alexi. And honesty should never be epic. Uh, if es Esquivel's story makes poor material for this epic, um, one of the things I, I might point out too, I, I'm thinking about Arthur Amiot's stories, and those of you who've read my book know that I've been thinking about Arthur's stories for a long time. Uh, I had the great good fortune to meet Arthur when I was beginning my work on Buffalo Bill, and the story of his family is one that made me think and rethink and rethink again my thinking about the Wild West show. Um, one of the ways to think about American Indian people generally, I think, is that today reservations are homelands, and they are also, the rhetoric is of tribal nations. Right? And I don't think they began that way, the reservations, but that's what they've become. And they are bordered regions with very different legal regimes than the rest of the United States. And Native people have very different relationship to the federal government than the rest of us. 
uh, and not one that's consistently in their favor. Let's just put it that way, right? It, it is a b th there is a way of thinking about native history as a kind of borderland history to get around this problem. How do you tell the story of people without having it end in national triumph uh, and yet have it be meaningful? If Esquivel's story makes poor material for the epic, and whatever we want to do about Native American stories in the Wild West show, is Cody's real story any different from Esquivel's in this regard? Consider, by the end of his life, Cody's success included bankruptcy, a failed effort to divorce his wife, the failure of virtually every business endeavor he took up. Almost every single one had failed. He had an enduring impact of Ameri on American culture, as we know, but his dream of creating a town, of being a town founder, of being a patrician, of retiring to a comfortable old age, he tells his friend Mike Russell, come on, invest in the town of Cody, and you and me, we're gonna irrigate 250,000 acres, more than the Mormons in Utah, and we're gonna sit up under the trees and swap lies, right? <laughs> That's the retirement he had envisioned for himself, not being on the road. He reconciled with Louisa the end, but that's, that's the, the ending he got. It might be better to consider himself, consider Cody himself as the impresario of a traveling border town and the Wild West show community here pictured at the 4th of July banquet in 1894 in Brooklyn. Uh, the, can the Wild West show community as a borderland community and Cody himself as a borderlander because I think in many ways if we're going to do borderland romance as a genre, in some ways it's more useful than the epic for revealing the honest truth about people. And it's honesty we're after in our presentation of history, I think. Thank you. Um, let's, let's talk quietly because it's 8.15 and some people may have fallen asleep. Um, <laughs> I actually had a class once. It was on the hot side of the building where the s in the afternoon where the sun was always hitting. And no matter what I did, students were falling asleep in that class. And I was uh, gesticulating and showing film clips and doing all my, and, and what I ended up doing was finally deciding, you know what I ought to do is just, you know, start to speak more quietly as one person falls asleep. And then as the next person get a little quieter and a little, and see if I can put them all to sleep. And then I'll just tiptoe out of the room and turn the lights <laughs> off on the way out. Uh, that was a tough semester. Okay, um, are, are there questions, comments? Should we go to the bar? <laughs> yeah. Chris. I, well, basically, I'm uh, Stoltz on the 90, but I think of my friends as Stoltz if we were in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
Yeah, and I think one of the things about uh, European history is it is Europe is full of borderlands. Uh, Buffalo Bill had huge success in Bill in Belgium, um, and you know, it's in France. And uh, any Belgians, I'm, I don't mean to offend you. But this French guy says to me, "Well, you know, the powers carved out Belgium to give the Germans a stopping place on their way into France." <laughs> right? That was the that it's it's carved out partly as a as a kind of buffer. Uh, right, and it is right. It, that whole tradition of the French, Dutch, right, the speakers in, in Belgium, and there are all kinds of places like this in Europe. And so, one of the things I think makes the show personalities, um, and the show, the stories of show, of performers in the show, so attractive for many people in those places. Uh, and to this day, many people in those places, as you know, seek uh, claim a connection to the show. There are many people who claim to be descended from Wild West show performers, from Buffalo Bills, right, from either native people in the show or from someone else, or Buffalo Bill himself. You know, it's, 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 it's all, you meet all kinds of people who will tell you all kinds of stories there that, uh, that you don't, uh, it's a very different brand of story you get in the United States, uh, at least that I've got, um, than, than I encountered in Europe in that sense. But I think that's a really good observation. And Borderlands historians, have, by the way, the Europeans have kind of captured a huge amount of borderlands history, and, and also the historians of Asia, uh, by the way, the borderlands histories in Asia are huge these days. No, thank you, Chris, for the, for the and thank you for the shout out about, about the, the, the latest book. Thank you, thank you. Um, other questions? Yes. Well, it's, that's a really good question. I mean, one way to do that would be to say, let's go down to the Southwest, because the show does tour in the Southwest. But interestingly, while the show went to, I mean, it goes to Ukraine, right? I, the way I put it to friends is Buffalo Bill would go almost anywhere there was a train, right, to pull the show. And that's what the show, the show is a creature in many ways of the, loc of the, of the railroad, <laughs> never to Mexico, right? Goes to the Balkans but never to Mexico. There are some absolutely crazy stories about trying to hold shows in places that don't have, you know, there's no currency around, right? And like, how are you gonna charge admission to people who don't have currency? We gotta move on to the next town. There are some crazy shows like this, um, but never to Mexico. And why that is, I'm not quite certain. It, um, the only Wild West show I know that went to Mexico was the 101 Ranch show, and it was a disaster financially for them. They got held up at the border for a day and a half, right? All their stuff gets, gets detained. Um, the other way to think about this, though, is that the history of Mexican-Americans is not, um, I'm constantly surprised, let me put it that way, by the history of Mexican-Americans. There's a Mexican-American community, Mexican-American slash Mexican community, I'm not sure which, because they're called Mexicans, at Pine Ridge. Right, Arthur and I have talked about this. There's a small community of them in the, in, uh, was that the early 1890s? I think we found them there, right? And they marry into, there are, are Mexicans or Mexican-Americans who marry into Lakota families. Right? There's a whole history uh, of this. Yeah, there's no language that endures, that's right. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's the so so that there's how to how to think about um, that. I have not actually spent a lot of time thinking about this, but I, I'll tell you what. I, I think that one of the things they could say, uh, kids who are Mexican American and go to the show would watch people like uh, Antonio Esquivel and Joe Esquivel, and whether those guys claimed Mexican American identity or not, the name on the program. Uh, and the stunts in the arena m might have been enough to validate the same way I talk about the Irish kids, right, and the German kids, right, seeing those, those cavalry men with those last names um, and feeling really validated by that. I, I think the same thing might have been true uh, of Mexican-American children, but I just don't know. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, way in the back. Ha, ha, ha. 
Oh, you're right, I'm much more concise. 549 pages. Yeah. Right. I think it, it they showed in the South, and they did okay. But not, as not nearly as much. I mean, you go look at those maps of where they're going in Indiana, right? And you, Elkhart is a continual, Elkhart, Indiana, continual stop on the show circuit. Um, I, my feeling about it is, is this, that you can't do history in the South without raising the issue of blackness, slavery, and the Civil War. Particularly among guys, if the show is run by guys who fought the Civil War, and not only Cody, Salisbury himself was a Civil War veteran, uh, he's very young when he was in the Civil War, and not a lot of love for the South. I don't, I don't feel it. They say nice things about the South, but I don't feel it in the, in their, when they're talking about it. The other thing, though, I would say is this, that Cody and Salisbury both tried, and I would say this, they tried a lot harder than most popular entertainers, white entertainers ever since, right, to figure out a way to incorporate the story of black people in American history. Uh, I didn't talk about it in this talk, but the Buffalo Soldiers are in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. When Theodore Roosevelt essentially says those black regiments in the, in the, in the charge of San Juan Hill didn't do anything, they're off on the side and didn't do anything, uh, it, which is not true. Right? That's what he writes in his Rough Rider Memorial. Um, Cody actually allows them to act out their own participation in that event. And there are Buffalo soldiers with the Wild West show for years. There are photos of them, right? Um, Salisbury and Cody invest in a show together at Salisbury's insistence called Black America, right? Where they're gonna show uh, the, pro the progress of, of the black man, as they put it, from, uh, how they put it, savage to slave to soldier to citizen. Uh, they, as it bombed, it just bombed, right? White people were not willing to pay to see it. And as Salisbury put it, I spent enough money to free Ireland <laughs> to learn that the average American doesn't care for his black brother except for about 24 hours on election day, right? Um, how do you tell the stories of, I mean, you get to places like South Carolina and Mississippi, you have majority black populations. You've got Indian War in the arena. You've got black soldiers involved on the side of civilization in that arena in the latter in the 1890s in that show. I don't think Southern audiences react particularly well to that. Um, they just they, how do you straddle all these divides? Cody is the, as I write in the in my book. Cody was a as a scout, right? The way you scout is you. One of the things that scouts knew is where all the divides were, where all the watersheds were, and you followed those, right, to, to keep yourself dry, among other things, but also that's the high, keep to the, the higher country that way, and it, it marks, the, you mark the countryside that way, and you can get where you want to go. But, and following the divides in the culture is his particular talent, but there are some divides you cannot span, I think, and that's, I just think the Wild West show didn't, was never very popular there for all those reasons, and by the way, the story of African Americans in the Wild West show, I, I looked high and low for sources. I, to my knowledge, and, and maybe, uh, I, maybe I, I've missed something in recent years, but there is no memoir of a Buffalo soldier, of his participation in, the, in, in fights with Indians or just in, in moving west. There are no sources for the, that are direct primary sources from those people. They were mostly illiterate freed people, right? I can't believe, I don't believe, that somebody in like the Chicago Defender or another African-American publication didn't sit somebody down and interview them at some point. But I've never seen an interview with a Buffalo Soldier, right? And let alone a Buffalo Soldier in the Wild West show. There are photographs of Buffalo Soldiers, and I don't think, last time I checked, we didn't have names for them uh, it, it, who were in the Wild West show. But anyway, for all these reasons, I, I think there's a lot more left to be done, but I think that the Wild West show in the South, yeah, it was a sticky proposition.
Thank you. Thank you all so much.